listen to me, and you shall hear. News hath not been heard this thousand years, since Herod and Caesar and many more, you never heard the like before. Holy days are despised, new fashions are devised, old Christmas is kicked out of town. Yet let's be content, and the times lament, you see the world turned upside down. Our lords and knights and gentry too, do mean old fashions to forego. They set a porter at the gate that none may enter in thereat. They count it a sin when poor people come in. Hospitality itself is drowned. Yet let's be content and the times lament. You see the world turned upside down. I think one of the favourite things that a story can do is show you the familiar through an inverted lens, such that you might not even realise uh, where the lines were, what the world you know is, and, and what's the mirror. The power of fantasy and science fiction particularly, and I know full well that I've got a good chance of preaching right to the preachers here, is not in their depiction of the strange and fantastic newness of new worlds, new people, new ideas, but in reflecting the worlds and people and ideas we've already got with a different light source, so you get different shadows. Um, a book that does this really, really well is The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin of Blessed Memory. She wrote about two worlds ostensibly polar opposites. One is a starkly consumerist world of excess and grandiosity where ideas are judged by profit and women are almost literally on display as trophies. The other world is an entirely collectivist society, uh, apparently the platonic ideal of an anarchist mutual society, mutual solidarity, uh, as a sort of functioning civilization. It's on that world that the main character, who is a theoretical physicist, uh, is raised. But he travels to the other world, the former world, uh, out of necessity, um, because the specialist focus and the support that he needs to, de to develop his theory into a working model, his, his world life, everything changing theory into a working model, can't be sustained in that collectivist society. He can't work on his on his theory and develop his theories if he has to keep going and working in the salt flats for example and in the capitalist world he's welcomed as a novelty in the sort of rarefied intellectual atmosphere but his work gets no traction because it can't be sold uh, it can't really be made into profit for anything and in the end his solution is to forcibly distribute this work between all of the worlds because neither system can work to the full benefit of everyone. That's a broad strokes, uh, broad strokes, strokes plot summary. I'm not trying to spoil anything here. It's a very good book. It's a perfectly written story in a lot of ways. And Le Guin occasionally said that the only change she would make was to add in a bit about the uh, communal pickle barrels on the collectivist world, standing on street corners to be filled and emptied at need when you have excess pickles or you just need pickles, which is a lovely idea. Um, and I, I, I really like that. I think we should probably implement that one here. Um, she also said that a lot of readers would mistake the anarchist society in the book and, and would write her letters talking about how it was such a better model, a clearly clearly perfect world. Um, and indeed it does kind of read that way because the chapters of the book are interleaved between the you know which world and uh, you get a pretty stark contrast between all the lurid Machiavellian excess of the capitalists and everything else. But her point was something else um, in all of that and it's too good a book to get into the nitty-gritty of that if you haven't read it, but uh, I strongly, strongly recommend it. Plus, you know, if you if you are of anarchist leanings, it is kind of one of the seminal texts, so definitely go for it. Um, in the spirit of all that, though, and in the spirit of worlds turned upside down and seen through mirrors, I'm going to read yet another Neil Gaiman story, big shock from the audience there, but it's online for free, for a reason, so link in the doobly-doo, um, and it's a good one. I've read it in two parts, so this is just part one, uh, and content warning, uh, placidly described gore, crime scene depictions. Um, this story answers the question, what would happen if Arthur Conan Doyle and H.P. Lovecraft had written a story together, but probably with a lot less racism? A Study in Emerald by Neil Gaiman it is the immensity, I believe, the hugeness of things below, the darkness of dreams, 
But I am wool-gathering, forgive me. I am not a literary man. I had been in need of lodgings, that was how I met him. I wanted someone to share the cost of rooms with me. We were introduced by a mutual acquaintance in the chemical laboratories of St. Bart's. You have been in Afghanistan, I perceive. That was what he said to me, and my mouth fell open, and my eyes opened very wide. Astonishing, I said. Not really, said the stranger in the white lab coat, who was to become my friend. From the way you hold your arm, I see you've been wounded, and in a particular way. You also have a deep tan, you also have a military bearing, and there are few enough places in the Empire that a military man can be both tanned, and, given the nature of the injury to your shoulder, and the traditions of the Afghan cave folk, tortured. Put like that, of course, it was absurdly simple. But then it always was. I had been tanned nut-brown, and I had, indeed, as he had observed, been tortured. The gods and men of Afghanistan were savages, unwilling to be ruled from Whitehall, or from Berlin, or even from Moscow, and unprepared to see reason. I had been sent into those hills, attached to the 8th Regiment. As long as the fighting remained in the hills and mountains, we fought on an equal footing. When the skirmishes descended into the caves and the darkness where we found ourselves, as it were, out of our depth, and in over our heads. I shall never forget the mirrored surface of the underground lake, nor the thing that emerged from the lake, its eyes opening and closing, the singing whispers that accompanied it as it rose, wreathing their way about it like the buzzing of flies bigger than worlds. That I survived was a miracle, but survive I did, and I returned to England with my nerves in shreds and tatters. The place that leech-like mouth had touched me was now tattooed forever, frog-white into the skin of my now withered shoulder. I had once been a crack shot. Now I had nothing, save a fear of the world beneath the world akin to panic, which meant that I would gladly pay sixpence of my army pension for a hansom cab, rather than a penny to travel underground. Still, the fogs and darknesses of London comforted me, took me in. I had been in Afghanistan, I was there no longer, and I lost my first lodgings, because I screamed in the night. I scream in the night, I told him. I have been told that I snore, he said. Also, I keep irregular hours, and I often use the mantelpiece for target practice. I will need the sitting room to meet clients. I am selfish, private, and easily bored. Will this be a problem? I smiled, and I shook my head and extended my hand. We shook on it. The rooms he had found for us in Baker Street were more than adequate for two bachelors. I bore in mind all my friend had said about his desire for privacy, and I forbore from asking what it was he did for a living. Still, there was much to pike my curiosity. Visitors would arrive at all hours, and when they did, I would leave the sitting room and repair to my bedroom, wondering what they could possibly have in common with my friend. The pale woman, with one eye bone white, the small man who looked like a commercial traveller, the portly dandy in his velvet jacket and the rest. Some were frequent visitors, many others came only once, spoke to him and left, looking troubled or looking satisfied. He was a mystery to me. We were partaking of one of our landlady's magnificent breakfasts one morning, when my friend rang the bell to summon that good lady. There will be a gentleman joining us in about four minutes, he said. We will need another place at the table. Very good, she said. I'll put more sausages under the grill. My friend returned to perusing his morning paper. I waited for an explanation with growing impatience, and finally I could stand it no longer. I don't understand. How could you know that in four minutes we would be receiving a visitor? There's no telegram, no message of any kind. He smiled thinly. You did not hear the clatter of a brougham several minutes ago. It slowed as it passed us, obviously the driver identified our door. Then it sped up and went past up into the Marylebone Road. There's a crush of carriages and taxicabs letting off passengers at the railway station and at the waxworks, and it is in that crush that anyone wishing to alight without being observed will go. The walk from there to here is but four minutes. He glanced at his pocket watch, and as he did so, I heard a tread upon the stairs outside. Come in, Lestrade, he called. The door is ajar, and your sausages are just coming out from under the grill. A man.
man I took to be Lestrade opened the door and then closed it carefully behind him. I should not, he said, but truth to tell, I have not had a chance to break my fast this morning and I could certainly do justice to a few of those sausages. He was the small man I had observed on several occasions previously, whose demeanour was that of a traveller in rubber novelties or patent nostrums. My friend waited until our landlady had left the room before he said, Obviously, I take it this is a matter of national importance. My stars, said Lestrade, and he paled. Surely the word cannot be out already. Tell me it's not. He began to pile his plate high with sausages, kipper fillets, kedgery and toast, but his hands shook a little. Of course not, said my friend. I know the squeak of your brown wheels, though, after all this time. An oscillating G-sharp above high C, and if Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard cannot be publicly seen to come into the parlour of London's only consulting detective, yet comes anyway, and without having had his breakfast, then I know that this is not a routine case. Ergo, it involves those above us, and is a matter of national importance. Lestrade dabbed egg yolk from his chin with his napkin. I stared at him. He did not look like my idea of a police inspector, but then my friend looked little enough like my idea of a consulting detective, whatever that might be. Perhaps we should discuss the matter privately, Lestrade said, glancing at me. My friend began to smile impishly, and his head moved on his shoulders as it did when he was enjoying a private joke. Nonsense, he said. Two heads are better than one, and what is said to one of us is said to us both. If I am intruding, I said gruffly, but he motioned me to silence. Lestrade shrugged. It's all the same to me, he said after a moment. If you solve the case, I have my job. If you don't, then I have no job. You use your methods. That's what I say. Can't make anything worse. If there's one thing that a study of history has taught us, it is that things can always get worse, said my friend. When do we go to Shoreditch? Lestrade dropped his fork. This is too bad, he exclaimed. Here you were, making sport of me when you know all about the matter. You should be ashamed. No one has told me anything of the matter. When a police inspector walks into my room with fresh splashes of mud of that peculiar mustard yellow hue on his boots and trouser legs, I can surely be forgiven pres for presuming that he has recently walked past the diggings at Hobbs Lane in Shoreditch, which is the only place in London that particular mustard-coloured clay seems to be found. Inspector Lestrade looked embarrassed. Well, now you put it like that, he said, it seems so obvious. My friend pushed his plate away from him. Of course it does he said, slightly testily. We rode to the east end in a cab. Inspector Lestrade had walked up to the Marylebone Road to find his brow and left us alone. So, are you truly a consulting detective? I said. The only one in London, or perhaps the world, said my friend. I do not take cases, instead I consult. Others bring me their insoluble problems, they describe them, and I sometimes solve them. Then those people who come to you are in the main police officers or are detectives themselves, yes. It was a fine morning, but we were now jolting about the edges of the rookery of St Giles, that warren of thieves and cutthroats which sits on London like a cancer on the face of a pretty flower cellar, and the only light to enter the cab was dim and faint. Are you sure you wish me along with you? In reply, my friend stared at me without blinking. I have a feeling... He said, I have a feeling that we were meant to be together, that we have fought the good fight side by side in the past, or in the future, I do not know. I am a rational man, but I have learned the value of a good companion, and from the moment I clapped eyes on you, I knew I trusted you as well as I do myself. Yes, I want you with me. I blushed, or said something meaningless. For the first time since Afghanistan, I felt that I had worth in the world. It was a cheap rooming house in Shoreditch. There was a policeman at the front door. Lestrade greeted him by name and made to usher us in, and I was ready to enter. But my friend squatted on the doorstep and pulled a magnifying glass from his coat pocket. He examined the mud on the wrought iron boot scraper, prodding at it with his forefinger. Only when he was satisfied would he let us go inside. We walked upstairs. The room in which the crime had been committed was obvious. It had been flanked by two burly constables. Lestrade nodded to the men and they stood aside. We walked in. I am not, as I have said, a writer by profession. I hesitate to describe that place knowing my words cannot do it justice. Still, I have begun this narrative and I fear I must continue. 
A murder had been committed in that little bedsit. The body, what was left of it, was still there on the floor. I saw it, but at first somehow I did not see it. What instead I saw at first was what had sprayed and gushed from the throat and chest of the victim. In colour it ranged from bile green to grass green. It had soaked into the threadbare carpet and spattered the wallpaper. I imagined it for one moment the work of some hellish artist who had decided to create a study in emerald. After what seemed like a hundred years, I looked down at the body, opened like a rabbit on a butcher's slab, and tried to make sense of what I saw. I removed my hat and my friend did the same. He knelt and inspected the body, inspecting the cuts, the gashes, then he pulled out his magnifying glass and walked over to the wall, examining the gouts of drying ichor. We've already done that, said Lestrade. Indeed, said my friend. Then what did you make of this, then? I do believe it's a word. Lestrade walked to the place my friend was standing and looked up. There was a word, written in capitals, in green blood, on the faded yellow wallpaper some little way above Lestrade's head. Ra-Rach? said Lestrade, spelling it out. Obviously he was going to write Rachel, but he was interrupted, so we must look for a woman. My friend said nothing. He walked back to the corpse and picked up its hands one after the other. The fingertips were clean of ichor. I think we have established that the word was not written by His Royal Highness. What the devil makes you say, my dear Lestrade, please give me some credit for having a brain. The corpse is obviously not that of a man. The colour of his blood, the number of limbs, the eyes, the position of the face, all these things bespeak the blood royal. While I cannot say which royal line, I would hazard that he is an heir, perhaps, no, second to the throne in one of the German principalities. That is amazing, Lestrade hesitated, and then he said, This is Prince Franz Drago of Bohemia. He was here in Albion as a guest of Her Majesty Victoria, here for a holiday and a change of air. For the theatres, the whores, and the gaming tables, you mean? If you say so, Lestrade looked put out. Anyway, you've given us a fine lead with this Rachel woman, although I don't doubt we won't have found her on her own. Doubtless, said my friend. He inspected the room further, commenting acidly several times that the police with their boots had obscured footprints and moved things that might have been of use to anyone attempting to reconstruct the events of the previous night. Still, he seemed interested in a small patch of mud he found beside the door. Next to the fireplace, he found what appeared to be some ash or dirt. Did you see this? he asked Lestrade. Her Majesty's police, replied Lestrade, tend not to be excited by ash in a fireplace. It's where ash tends to be found. And he chuckled at that. My friend took a pinch of the ash and rubbed it between his fingers, then sniffed the remains. Finally, he scooped up what was left of the material and tipped it into a glass vial, which he stoppered and placed in an inner pocket of his coat. He stood up. And the body? Lestrade said. The palace will send their own people. My friend nodded at me, and together we walked to the door. My friend sighed. Inspector, your quest for Miss Rachel may prove fruitless. Among other things, rush is a German word. It means revenge. Check your dictionary. There are other meanings. We reached the bottom of the stair and walked out onto the street. You have never seen royalty before this morning, have you? He asked. I shook my head. Well, the sight can be unnerving if you're unprepared. Why, my good fellow, you're trembling. Forgive me. I'll, I'll be fine in a few moments. Would it do you good to walk? He asked, and I assented, certain that if I did not walk, then I would begin to scream. West, then, said my friend, pointing to the dark tower of the palace, and we commenced to walk. So, said my friend after some time, you have never had any personal encounters with any of the crowned heads of Europe. No, I said. I believe I can confidently state that you shall, he told me, and not with a corpse this time, very soon. My dear fellow, what makes you believe? In reply, he pointed to a carriage, black painted, that had pulled up fifty yards ahead of us. A man in a black top hat and a great coat stood by the door, holding it open, waiting silently. A coat of arms familiar to every child in Albion was painted in gold upon the carriage door. There are invitations one does not refuse, said my friend. He doffed his own hat to the footman, and I do believe that he was smiling as he climbed into the box-like space and relaxed back into the soft and leathery cushions. When I attempted to speak with him during the journey to the palace, 
He placed his finger over his lips. Then he closed his eyes and seemed sunk in, th in thought. I, for my part, tried to remember what I knew of German royalty. But apart from the Queen's consort, Prince Albert being German, I knew little enough. I put my hand in my pocket and pulled out a handful of coins, brown and silver, black and copper green. I stared at the portrait stamped on each of them and our Queen, and felt both patriotic pride and stark dread. I told myself I had once been a military man and a stranger to fear, and I could remember a time when this had been the plain truth. For a moment I remembered a time when I had been a crack shot, even I liked to think something of a marksman, but my right hand shook as if it were palsied, and the coins jingled and chinked, and I felt only regret. The Queen's consort, Prince Albert, was a big man, with an impressive handlebar moustache and a receding hairline, and he was undeniably and entirely human. He met us in the corridor, nodded to my friend and to me, did not ask us for our names or offer to shake hands. The Queen is most upset, he said. He had an accent. He pronounced his S's as Z's. Most upset. France was one of her favourites. She has so many nephews, but he made her laugh so. You will find the ones who did this to him. I will do my best said my friend. I have read your monographs, said Prince Albert. It was I who told them that you should be consulted. I hope I did right. As do I, said my friend. And then the great door was opened, and we were ushered into darkness, and the presence of the Queen. She was called Victoria, because she had beaten us in battle seven hundred years before, and she was called Gloriana, because she was glorious, and she was called the Queen, because the human mouth was not shaped to say her true name. She was huge, huger than I had imagined possible, and she squatted in the shadows, staring down at us without moving. This must be solved, the words came from the shadows. Indeed, ma'am, said my friend. A limb squirmed and pointed at me. Step forward. I wanted to walk. My legs would not move. My friend came to my rescue then. He took me by the elbow and walked me toward Her Majesty. It is not to be afraid, it is to be worthy, it is to be a companion. That was what she said to me. Her voice was a very sweet contralto with a distant buzz. Then the limb uncoiled and extended, and she touched my shoulder. There was a moment, but only a moment, of a pain deeper and more profound than anything I have ever experienced, and then it was replaced by a pervasive sense of well-being. I could feel the muscles in my shoulder relax, and for the first time since Afghanistan I was free from pain. Then my friend walked forward. Victoria spoke to him, yet I could not hear her words. I wondered if they went somehow directly from her mind to his, if this was the Queen's counsel I had read about in the histories. He replied aloud. Certainly, ma'am. I can tell you that there were two other men with your nephew in that room in Shoreditch that night. The footprints were, although obscured, unmistakable. And then, yes, I understand. I believe so. Yes. He was quiet when we left the palace, and said nothing to me as we rode back to Baker Street. It was dark already. I wondered how long we had spent in the palace. Fingers of sooty fog twined across the road and the sky. Upon our return to Baker Street, in the looking-glass of my room, I noticed that the frog-white skin across my shoulder had taken on a pinkish tinge. I hoped that I was not imagining it, that it was not merely the moonlight through the window. End of part one.